I'm not quite sure how that's all come about, but theology matters. <laughs> now, we come to our second of four studies now on the doctrine of Scripture. And I just want to um, remind you of what we said at the very end last week, a clarification that, that in this short series of studies, we would seek to unpack what the Bible says about the Bible. And that's why we looked at Psalm 119 la last week. We were wanting to see what does the Bible say about itself. Let's put the Bible in the dock and let it speak and give its own witness and give its own testimony. So we're not going into the way that other books cover and the ground that other books cover uh, in an apologetic defense of the scriptures, but we are trying to let the Bible speak for itself. Scripture itself is alone competent to judge our doctrine of scripture. And so tonight, I want us to go to 2 Peter chapter 1. I want to read right away verses 16 to 21. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 to 21. Um, could I just have a show of hands? How many of you have read 2 Peter in the last six months? One person has. Okay, great. It's not one of those books that... Um, we know very well, so I will read chunks of it through our talk. But Second Peter 1, you should have an outline, and we've printed the notes continuing on the back there, and you should also have another sheet which is put carefully on your seat, or near a seat when you were worshipping there, excerpts from the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy. It's a little bit more technical, isn't it? But you should have one of those as well, okay? Right, First Peter, Second Peter, sorry, Second Peter chapter 1 and verses 16 to 21. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And we are going to unpack those verses, and we're going to put them in the whole context of Second Peter as well. But I can remember reading a good number of years ago an article in Christianity Today magazine, I think from some of my notes I've scribbled down, it was about 2007, that's the USA Christianity Today magazine, an article entitled, My Conversation with God. And how I remember the article going was this. The writer asked the question at the beginning, does God still speak? And he went on to say, I grew up hearing testimonies about it. Until two years ago, I couldn't say it had ever happened to me that he had heard God speak. I'm a middle-aged professor of theology at a well-known Christian university. I've written many award-winning books. For years, I've taught that God still speaks, but I couldn't testify to it personally. I can only do so now anonymously for reasons I hope will become clear in the rest of the article. And then he says, a year after hearing God's voice, I still can't talk or even think about my conversation with God without being overcome with emotion. 
And the anonymous professor goes on to talk about an experience he had when God supernaturally gave him a book outline, a title of the book, and then directed him to use the money from the sale of that book to help a young man go to college and prepare for the Christian ministry. As far as I can remember in the notes that I took, he finished the article by saying how his faith had been strengthened to have had God finally, personally speak to him. I thought, that's a great testimony, isn't it? In many ways. But as I processed it and thought about it, I, and as I reread the article, it gave me the impression that God does not normally speak to us personally. And the article left me with the impression and with the feeling that God speaking to us through the scriptures is an inferior, less exciting, less edifying means of communication. It's almost as though if we had to conclude, yes, the Bible is really important, but oh, what a treasure it would be if I could really experience God speaking to me. If only I could hear from the sure, infallible voice of God. Let me ask you a question. Can you imagine God speaking to you personally, certainly, and authoritatively. The good news, which I judge that uh, professor writing, seem to have missed, is that every single day, every one of us can hear God speaking to us, right now, at this very moment, because God still speaks. And he has a word for us that is completely reliable, utterly trustworthy, and inspired by the Holy Spirit. And those three phrases that I've just used, completely reliable, utterly trustworthy, and inspired by the Spirit, all come out of that passage that I've just read to you from 2 Peter chapter 1. So I leave that just to ruminate around in your mind, that illustration. So let us look first then at the context of the book of Second Peter. And the letter is overall an exhortation to godliness. And in chapter 1, verses 3 to 11, we see there the power for godliness is in God's great and precious promises. Verses 3 and 4, God's divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. So there is the power for godliness in these great and precious promises. Then secondly, the pattern for godliness is in those things that can be added to our faith. And here, verses 5 to 7, Peter says, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith. Here's the pattern of godliness. The power, okay, is in the precious promises, and they're great. The pattern is make every, re every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. And the premise, the thing behind godliness, is our calling and election, and that's in verses 8 to 11. For if you possess these qualities, 
in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is short-sighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. The fact that you have been called by the grace of God, that you have been elected before the foundation of the world. And you can confirm that by following this pattern of godliness and experience the power for it through these great promises. Then, in verses 12 to 15, Peter says he wants to remind his readers of these things before he dies. So he has a sense of urgency in what he is writing here. So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of my body, because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me, and I will make every effort to see that after my departure you will always be able to remember these things. Now can you see Peter is really building up and laying a foundation to what he is actually going to say about the scriptures. Peter is also concerned about false teachers. And these false teachers who were beginning to creep into the church and peddle their false doctrines. And what were these false teachers doing? They were promising freedom. But Peter said, no, if you end up following them, they will lead you into spiritual bondage. They won't lead you into freedom. Look at verse 2 of chapter 2. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth and will, yes, and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers, the false ones, will exploit you with fabricated stories. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. And then if you come down to verse 10, this is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the flesh and despise authority. And then verses 18, and particularly verse 19, but from 18, for they mouth empty, boastful words, and by appealing to the lustful desires of their flesh, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They promise them, what? Freedom, while they themselves are slaves of depravity, for people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. So Peter is saying, ignore these false teachers and pursue holiness. Now, one of the chief reasons for doing this is in fact the truth of the second coming of Christ. Why should I ignore and turn away from these false teachers and pursue godliness? Because the day of the Lord will surely arrive. And when the day of the Lord comes, Peter says, the world will be destroyed, our works will be exposed, and the ungodly will be judged. Chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in, in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. So, in Peter's letter, and throughout the rest of the New Testament, the second coming of Christ is spoken of as a profound motivation to turn aside from wickedness and to make every effort to live an upright life. 
because we do not want to be found doing unholy things when, as Peter calls him, the Holy One appears. Very simply it. We don't want to be found doing unholy things when the Holy One returns. Now, the false teachers also doubted that the Lord would come back again. And they seem to have doubted particularly that he would come back in, on some cataclysmic day, which is termed the day of the Lord in chapter three, uh, chapter 3, verses 2 to 4. These false teachers didn't believe in this day of judgment. So Peter wants to convince their, his readers, us, that Christ is coming back, And he's coming back to judge the living and the dead and that his return will be a wonderful sight to behold, a glorious cataclysmic thing. Now you say, what on earth has all that got to do with the doctrine of Scripture? Well, we're getting there. To substantiate his claim, Peter now gives two pieces of evidence for this. Number one, eyewitness testimony. And number two, authoritative documents. Eyewitness uh, testimony, uh, verses 16 and 18, for we did not follow clearly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. What's he referring to here? He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven. We were with him on the sacred mountain. He's giving an eyewitness testimony of something. What is the event he's giving an eyewitness testimony to? No, not the baptism of Jesus. That was when the Father gave that confirmation and affirmation. When did the Father give that again? On on the transfiguration. The transfiguration. So, can you see how Peter, he's bringing in all sorts of truths here, you know, and he's building them all up into something very profound. And he's going to, that profundity is going to come out in what he says about the scriptures. He says, we were eyewitness of this glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says in verses 19 to 21, we also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. So he's talking about authoritative documents. Now, these were the two basic types of evidence in the ancient world. And in fact, not much has changed since, has it really? Today, lawyers make their case in court by calling on what? Witnesses, eyewitnesses, and submitting documents to the court for them to see. And if you want to prove your point in a court of law, what do you need? You need eyewitness testimony, and you need trustworthy sources. Now, the Apostle Peter had both and we need to examine them in turn. First of all, these eyewitness testimony. Peter is sure of Christ's glorious return someday in the future. On what basis? Well, he's sure of it because he saw Christ transfigured in glory on the sacred mountain. He's seen it already. He's been an eyewitness of it already. And so he's giving eyewitness testimony that it will be on an even greater uh, dimension when Christ comes again. Peter, along with James and John, had heard the Father's word. They had been eyewitnesses of the Son's majesty, and they had seen what they had seen that day. Now, other people, when they told them of that, that, that event, may have said, oh, Peter, you're just hallucinating, or that's just wishful thinking. No, Peter, James, and John would not have it. They would have said, we were on the mountain. 
we were witness of the transfiguration of Jesus. And therefore, we know beyond a a doubt that Christ is not a person to be trifled with. We haven't made him just an invention of ourselves. He's not a product of our own thinking. We have actually seen something of his glory. So the language that Paul is using here in verse 16 is so important to our doctrine of Scripture. Now, in recounting the events of the transfiguration, Peter makes it clear that he did not follow cleverly devised myths. Okay? He hadn't suffered hallucination. And he wasn't following cleverly devised myths. Now, some liberal scholars have tried to use the category of myth to describe the Bible. Now, stay with me here. They say that myth is not the same as force. Okay? So you really got to keep a track with me here. These liberal uh, theologians argue that while the facts of Scripture may not always be believable, the larger, deeper truth still is. Now, do you see what these people are saying? And it is a very, very persuasive argument, as I will demonstrate further. They're saying, look, the history, the historicity of the Bible doesn't so much matter as to the message that comes out of it. So whether those events actually took place, well, we can debate that. But what is of vital importance is the message, the truth that is taught from those stories. For example, They suggest that the plagues in Egypt, in our Old Testament, the crossing of the Red Sea, may not be historically true. That means it didn't actually happen. However, we need not call into question the power of God or his ability to set people free. We don't have to believe that he actually set them free from Egypt and brought them across the the sea. We can still believe in the power of God to set people free from their bad habits, their dominating uh, addictions. We can still believe in the power of God to do those sorts of things. Jesus may or may not have walked on water. They say that doesn't really matter. The important point is that he will do anything to help us if we trust him. See, he was walking on the water to to the disciples. He was going to help them. So what we learn from it is the lesson is the important thing, not whether he actually physically did it. Come to the resurrection of Jesus. And many bishops have been of this persuasion, many of them. The resurrection of Jesus is not to be taken literally as a bodily resurrection but rather it is a powerful symbol that God can give us new spiritual life and snatch victory in our lives from the jaws of defeat. Do you see what they're saying? You don't need to believe in the physical, literal, historical, bodily erection of Jesus. All you need to believe is God can cause you to be born again spiritually in your heart. So you had the internal subjective experience that the objective, historical, verifiable historical fact doesn't matter. Now, this kind of of thinking invades uh, a lot of people's minds. We're coming up to Christmas and to Advent very soon. Is it important to believe in the historicity of the virgin birth? Did a virgin actually conceive? Is a belief in the, it's not a virgin birth, Jesus was born in exactly the same way as you and I were born. It is a virgin conception. 
is a belief in the virgin conception of Jesus essential to Bible-believing Christians? Or is the message that we can take from it that Jesus can be born in our hearts, the deeper truth, we don't have to worry as to whether it physically happened. These folks, and don't worry if you don't see this point here, but these folks, uh, liberal theologians, emphasize that faith can say, from Matthew's Gospel, how can this be, remember Mary's words, since I am still a virgin? That that can be an expression of her inner faith. For my part, I take the statement, all things are possible with God, which comes in the same verse, far more valuable to my faith than how can this be since I am still a virgin. Because if all things are possible with God, why do I need to choke on a, the miraculous virgin birth? If I believe everything is possible with God, then I can believe in a virgin birth, can't I? And a, bod a physical bodily resurrection. So the liberal understanding of history is completely at odds with the Bible's own self-understanding. Now, the Greek word mythos, myth, is always used negatively in the New Testament. And you can look at those, uh, what, five or six references there. Myth is seen as the opposite of faith. I just read those verses from 2 Timothy. Paul there warns, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Now, for the Bible writers, there is myth on one side, and there is truth on the other. And the Bible clearly belongs on the side of truth, not on the side of myth. Now, if you have read about these things, you may want to come back to me at this point and say, John, surely the liberal theologian's definition of myth is not exactly what the New Testament is condemning when it talks to us about avoiding myths. If you're following me, I would say to that, that's a fa that's fair comment. But you cannot get round the logic of Peter in 2 Peter 1.16 in referring to his role as an eyewitness. And Peter there wants everyone to know that the Jesus story... The transfiguration of Jesus primarily and presumably all the other stories of the life of Jesus is in the category of historical verifiable fact and not in the area of impressions on my heart or inner experiences that I may feel or stories invented in my mind to make a point. Have you got that, that there? Very, very important. You see, the Greeks and the Romans had lots and lots of myths. Now, they didn't care whether their stories about their gods were true or not. Nobody who lived in Rome was interested in the historical evidence for the claim that Hercules was the illegitimate son of Zeus. Nobody was interested or worried about the historical claim for that. It was a myth. It was a fable. It was what we say a tall story. It was a story that was told to entertain people. And it was repeated again and again. It was also used as they tried to make some sense of the world in which they lived in those days. But paganism was built on the power of mythology. But Christianity, like the Jewish faith from which it sprang, saw itself as an entirely different religion. 
Now, the next thing I want to say, I, I just cannot say it or state it too strongly, and it's this. From the very beginning, Christianity tied itself to history. Christianity tied itself to history. And some of the most important claims of Christianity are historical claims, like the resurrection of Jesus. And on the facts of history, Christianity stands or falls. So please don't ever say you're not interested in history. Luke's Gospel. Take Luke. Luke is recognized as a very qualified historian. And so both in his Gospel and in his Acts, he says there, particularly at the beginning of both books, how he followed all these things that he's writing about very closely. He researched things carefully. He relied on the account of eyewitnesses. So that the man he was writing to, this man called Theophilus, could have absolute certainty about the gospel stories of Jesus. Now, you probably know there's great debate as to who Theophilus was. I tend to side with those who think that Theophilus was the lawyer that Paul um, employed when he was awaiting trial in Rome. And what was Luke doing? Luke was sending to Paul's lawyer in Rome an account of the life of Jesus. Because that's why, that's why Paul was arrested there for what he was preaching and saying about Jesus. So Luke was giving Theophilus all the info, the documents that he needed to defend Paul. And you remember, Paul was put back into prison. And then Paul was, uh, had to appear again in court. Well, of course, what then did Luke do? He sent him another batch of documents, this time the Acts of the Apostles, to say it didn't stop with Jesus, that the message of Jesus was carried on in the life of the early church. And so you get in the Acts the whole spread of Christianity in the then known world. And so what Luke did there, you know, that's the largest part of our New Testament that Luke has written in his Gospel and in the Acts. And look how he starts Luke, his, uh, his, his Gospel. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of these things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of this word. Yes, of course he's mentioning eyewitnesses. He's writing a, a legal brief to Theophilus. So he says, there, this is eyewitnesses, Theophilus. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, he said, I've carefully investigated it all. I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the th things you have been taught. John, you remember, in his Gospel, uh, wrote about the miracles that Jesus performed. Why? So that his readers would accept those miracles and understand what the message behind those signs were, and that they would come to believe that Jesus is the Christ and have life in, through his name. And John tells us that in John 20, 31. Now, I hope when you're reading a book of the New Testament, particularly, and I won't tell you which ones, so you can have the joy of this discovery, if you want to know what the book is all about, read the last chapter. Because often in the New Testament, in the last chapter, we are told the purpose of which the writer was writing. And you have to do that with John. You have to read the last chapter of John first. Then you go back. And then you'll read it through the eyes of the writer, John himself, what he was seeking to achieve by writing. So that's very important. So all the Gospel writers are eager for us to know that 
though some people were spreading rumors that Christ's body had been stolen after the crucifixion, the tomb was really empty because Jesus had been raised from the dead. And Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, he writes, if Christ wasn't raised, then the whole Christian religion is a sham. And those who believe it have been deceived and are fools. Fools to believe it. Absolute fools. So discount history is to live in a different world from the one the biblical writers inhabit. It's as if Peter is saying, look, I saw the transfiguration, and I was not alone. We heard it. We were eyewitnesses. We were ear witnesses. We are not making this up. We are not passing on intriguing stories or clever tales. We are telling you what actually happened. We saw his glory. We saw it with our own eyes. We heard God speak audibly. This is not just an experience in our hearts or a vision in our spirits or souls. If you had been there on the mountain, you would have seen it and heard these things. So we are talking about facts and not fables. Now, remember the point that Peter is making here. He is not writing some abstract, apologetic textbook. He wants his readers to be holy and godly. He wants them to think about the life they are living in the light of Christ's return. And so he is trying to convince them of the certainty of the second coming. And one way is to prove that a glorious, dreadful, amazing, wonderful, fearful second coming of Christ will happen in history. And he does that by reminding his readers that he has already seen a glorious, dreadful, amazing, wonderful, fearful appearing of Christ. Peter saw the unveiling. He saw what Christ looked like in his full divine glory. And he realized at that point that Jesus was more than a carpenter, more than an open-minded guru, more than a non-judgmental preacher. When he saw Jesus sparkle in white, and dazzle in majesty in the glory cloud, he knew that at that moment, Jesus was all that he claimed to be. He was the world's great life changer. And when Jesus comes again, we will see that glory for ourselves. Now, that's the point Peter has been making, and that's the evidence of eyewitness testimony. Now the second point. Peter points out that the return of Christ also depends on the trustworthiness of authoritative documents. Now this is 1 Peter 1, oh sorry, sorry 2 Peter 1, verses 19 to 21. The prophetic message came before Peter's eyewitness account. That means the Old Testament came before uh, Peter's eyewitness account. And what happened on the mountain simply confirmed what the prophetic word in the Old Testament had already been saying. Now, there are three things from these verses about the nature of Scripture here. Number one, Scripture is the word of God. And you'll notice in your notes, I put the word is in italics. Now, this may th seem an unnecessary thing to say, but the word is actually says something very important here. You see, some Christians, influenced by neo-orthodox theologians. Now, I don't know whether you've come across that phrase before, but a neo-orthodox theologian is a theologian who sails very close to the wind. Sometimes when you read the neo-orthodox theologians, you think, quite a great Bible teaching there. That is fantastic. He's neo-orthodox. But then he goes right off the ro 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 rails at times. I suppose one of the greatest 
theologians of the 20th century, Karl Barth, he was a neo-Orthodox theologian. I would say that at the end of his life, when he started writing a commentary on the Lord's Prayer, his introduction to the Lord's Prayer and the first few petitions in the Lord's Prayer, I would say to you, is the best I've ever read anywhere. But I've just told you he was a neo-Orthodox theologian. But his understanding of prayer was absolutely amazing. And an understanding of what we know as the Lord's Prayer today. So people like Barth and others are hesitant to say that the Bible is the Word of God. So what do they do? They argue that the Bible contains the Word of God. Or they say the Bible becomes the word of God. Or, thirdly, that the event in which God speaks to us through the Bible is the word of God. Now, why do these people speak like this? Well, they want to distance themselves from the claim of inspiration. They want to distance themselves from saying all scripture all the written words on the pages of Scripture were inspired by God, were God-breathed. Now, this would be an idea totally foreign to Peter, for the claims he makes about prophecy and the prophetic message are made with reference to what? To the written words of Scripture. Okay? Now, don't, mis don't misinterpret the word prophecy here and prophet here. Peter is referring to the written word of Scripture, what we now know as the Old Testament. And Peter uses three different terms to refer to the word of God in these verses. The prophetic message, verse 19, prophecy of Scripture, verse 20, and prophecy in verse 21. They all mention prophecy, and they are all used more or less interchangeably. Now, important for us is the Greek word in verse 20, the Greek word graphe, which refers to something that has been written down. Graphe is always a written text, not just the oral tradition of a story being passed on from one generation to another generation by mouth. And I hear it, and then I pass it on by mouth to someone else. Graphe always has to do with a written text. And Peter's view of inspiration is not just limited to prophetic speech. It involves the very pages of Scripture. And the whole of the Old Testament is in view here. And the term, the law and the prophets, okay, the term, the law and the prophets, is used in the Bible to refer to the Old Testament. You know, the Hebrew, the Hebrew Bible was divided into three, the law, the prophets, and the writings. Now, Jesus, in Matthew 7, 12, makes the phrase, the law and the prophets. What he was referring, just to two sections of the old Hebrew Bible? No, he used the phrase, the law and the prophets, to refer to the three sections in the Hebrew Bible, the law, the prophets, and the writings. So the law and the prophets, he's not separating them out here. And no Jew would make a distinction that some parts of the scriptures were truer, more truer than other parts. Bible writers don't allow us that. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And whatever is true in the law is true of the prophets, is true of the writings. All three sections. And this matters because it means that the authority of God's word it's very important. The authority of God's word resides in the written text. It resides in the words, in the sentences, in the paragraphs of scripture. Not merely in our experience of the truth in our hearts. That's the distinction to make. The authority of Scripture resides in the written text, not in our experience of the truth in our hearts. 
Now, some people want to make inspiration more subjective, more internal, more experiential. But according to Peter, the inspiration of Scripture is an objective reality outside of ourselves and outside of our experience. It stands whether I experience or feel it or not. Now, however, big, big however here. Our evangelical doctrine of Scripture does not lead us away from the subjective and the internal and the experiential side of God. It doesn't. I've just said you in such strong language, haven't I, that the authority resides in the words, in the objective words, in the paragraphs and the pages, the text, the written text. But we do not conclude that that takes us away from the subjective, internal, and experiential side of the Word of God. Because that's why we studied Psalm 119 last time we were together. And I said, that's a love poem. And I put all the feeling that I could into explaining Psalm 119 to you. And you felt it, and I felt it. And I felt so good about it that I've spent the days there, I've taken one section of Psalm 119 each day since and read it through again. Because I thought, wow, I want to feel what the writer felt. I want to make sure my emotional life comes in line with the Word of God. And that's very hard to get your emotional life in line with the Word of God. That's the last thing that ever comes into line, I can tell you. It has a life of its own. And that's why it needs to get in line with the Word of God. So that I feel a stirring in my emotions over the right things. And so in verse 19 here, Peter says, pay attention to inspired scripture. Why? Why should I pay attention to it? Well, because it is a lamp shining in a dark place. Yes, God's word will convict me of sin. It will show me the way. It will lead me out of darkness into light. And we immerse ourselves in scripture. Why? I use Peter's language here, not the language of the psalmist in 119. He says, immerse yourselves in scripture so that the morning star, who's the morning star? Christ, Jesus Christ himself, would rise where? In our minds? No, in our hearts. So that the morning star will arise in our hearts. All the anticipation and joy of a new day and of a new beginning. Shedding light everywhere. So the goal of revelation is not just information, but worship, love for Christ, love for others, obedience. And I think I put it in, in the notes like this. Christ in us, note the word in, Christ in us will only be realized as we drink, drink, drink deeply of the Bible, which is God's word outside of us. Now, secondly, and the next two we can do more quickly. The word of God is no less divine because it is given through human instrumentality. Now, we do not hold, as evangelicals, to a mechanical dictation theory of inspiration. Now, you know what that means, more or less what it says. You're sitting at your computer, and God is just whispering in your ear, this is what you do, and all you do is put down exactly what you hear being said there. You don't reword it, you don't rephrase it, it just as it comes. It, almost, you're just a machine, and it's mechanical like that. Now, it's amazing how many times over the years sort of people who are on the fringe of evangelicalism will say that that is what we believe, that we have a mechanical view of inspiration. I, I, I don't know why I don't why people want to label that there, but um, that the writers of Scripture were passive instruments who merely recorded what they were given by rote from heaven. Now, what does Peter say here in verse 21? He says, men spoke, and in the implication, and wrote, as they were carried along 
by the Holy Spirit. Concursive operation. That, that's really me putting in a technical word there, so don't really need to even worry about that. But concursive operation is the word used to describe the process of inspiration, how it came about, or what it really means to be carried along by the Spirit. What that means is that God used the intellectual skills of the writers. He used their personality and the intellectual skills and the personality of fallible men to write down a document that was divine and infallible. Fallible men God used to write an infallible document. So we can say that the Bible is, in a very real sense, both a human and a divine book. And to say that the Bible is both a human and a divine book in no way implies the fallibility or the untrustworthiness of the Scriptures. The dual authorship of the Bible, God and man, does not mean that there must be imperfection any more than the two natures of Christ mean that Christ in his human nature sinned. I don't make that conclusion. So why should I make it when I say that there is a dual authorship of God and man in the scriptures? And in Jesus, there is God and man. Uh, Calvin has this nice sentence there. They dare not, this is the people writing the Bible, they dare not announce anything of their own and obediently followed the Spirit as their guide. I like this phrase of Calvin, who roared in their mouth as in his own sanctuary. That the Holy Spirit, Calvin is saying, where he lived, he was in their mouth and he was roaring in the mouths of the prophets what they were saying. Now this verb in verse 21, carried, Pharaoh, suggests an assured outcome. An outcome that is carried out and guaranteed by someone else, and some, that someone else is, of course, God himself. And the men who spoke and wrote from God had been taken up by the Holy Spirit, carried, brought by his power, to the goal of God's choosing. And the goal of God's choosing was the writing of the biblical text that you and I have and treasure. So the things they spoke and wrote under this process were what the Holy Spirit wanted written and not their own. And so the divine authorship of the scripture does not preclude the use of active human instrumentation. Now, you, you, you read the prophecy of Jeremiah. Now, what understanding do you have of the man there? That he was a laugh a minute guy? And he had a great sense of humor? Do you get that impression when you read Jeremiah? No, you don't. You find that he was a man who felt a huge weight on his shoulders of the message he had to bring. You know, everybody was, was against him. You know, and, and, and you know, he's, he, and he's accused of being a traitor because he says to the king when, when, when Jerusalem is being besieged, he says, God says to you, if you go and surrender to the army outside your walls, you will be saved and you will save your city. And of course, when the people heard Jeremiah saying that, they ran to the king. Hey, he's weakening morale. He's a traitor. But that was God's words, that if they had gone out and surrendered, then God would have saved the city. And of course, the people thought that Jerusalem was a place where God lived. And they never, 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 never had any concept in their mind that Jerusalem would fall. And so the personality of the man comes through. And when you read Ecclesiastes, well, you sense, yeah, you could understand that the person who wrote Proverbs could write Ecclesiastes. And then you think, Song of Solomon as well? Where does that fit in? So you jiggle around a little bit and you say, yes. Ah, S Solomon wrote Song of Songs as a young man. 
in his middle age, having sown his wild oats, he writes the book of Proverbs, and he says in chapter after chapter there, my son, my son, listen to this, my son, listen to this. Why does he keep saying, my son, my son, my son? Well, he doesn't want his son to repeat the mistakes that he made. And then he writes Ecclesiastes as an older man, looking back and reflecting on life and saying, you know, what's it all about? Where's the meaning to it? You know, it's all like chasing the wind. You think you've got it there in your hand and it's gone, it's blown, it's gone further down and away from you. So the Spirit guided these people and they were able to express their personality without there being any corruption of the text. Thirdly, the Bible is without error. They do the Bible's the text does not come from human interpretation, verse 20. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. The ultimate authorship of Scripture, Peter is saying, is God himself. And the simplest way of showing the Bible is without error is to say Scripture did not come from the will of man, it came from God, and if it is God's word, then it must all be true, for in him there can be no error or deceit. Okay? Now, we come to this next word, inerrancy. Uh, now, on your second sheet, you'll see there excerpts from the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy. Inerrancy is a real hot potato today. Inerrancy is the belief that within the Bible, when the Bible is talking on other matters which are not spiritual or theological or ethical, but it's referring to historical, archaeological things, that the Bible is as true in that sphere as it is when it is talking about moral and ethical and theological matters. Okay? And uh, again, a lot of evangelicals are really divided over this. They say, yes, I accept the authority and inspiration of Scripture when it is speaking about theology and belief and morals and ethics. But I don't accept the inerrancy of Scripture when it is talking about historical, scientific matters. You know, how can I accept where, where God and in the prophet they speaks about the four corners of the earth? Well, that's a non-scientific statement, isn't it? You know, we, we know that the, 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 the earth doesn't have four corners. It's a sphere. But what, what, what do the scripture writers mean when they say the four corners? They're referring to the four co- points of the compass, north, south, east, and west. You know, and then people say to you, ah, the ah, Bible's not, scient- not true scientifically because it says that the sun rises. Do you know? You, you, well, it doesn't, does it? Well, you and I know scientifically it doesn't rise. But when you say, this, oh, what a lovely sunrise. Oh, what a lovely sunset the other night. Now, you don't mean that the sun has actually gone down in that sense in the sky. There are scientific reasons, and you know them as the the rotation of the sun uh, and everything. So when you look at these things in greater detail and you examine them, you can find understanding. And belief on the inerrancy of Scripture is such a hot potato that in 1978, that's a long time ago, um, 300 evangelical scholars got together and made a statement, which is certainly well worth reading, and I've only included five, no, three articles from it here. Number, article number five says, and these documents, when they are made by scholars, normally have, we affirm, and then they say, in affirming this, we are not saying this, so we deny something else. So article number five, we affirm that the whole of scripture and its parts down to the very words of the original, obviously the original documents, not uh, translations, were given by divine inspiration. That means we deny that the inspiration of scripture can rightly be affirmed of the whole without the parts or of some parts but not the whole. You see what they're getting at there. You cannot say that part is inspired and part isn't. 
Article 11, we affirm that scripture has been given by divine inspiration, is infallible, so that far from misleading us, it is true and reliable in all manner matters it addresses. So the Bible is not only it true when it addresses moral issues, it is also true when it is making what we would say was a scientific comment today. We deny that it is impossible for the Bible to be at the same time infallible and errant in its assertions. Infallibility and inerrancy may be distinguished but not separated. Article 12, we affirm that scripture is in its entirety inerrant, being free from all falsehood, fraud and deceit. We deny that biblical infallibility and inerrancy are limited to spiritual, religious, or redemptive themes exclusive of assertions in the fields of history and science. Now, I could go on for a lot longer by giving you illustration after illustration of that. But modern archaeology is confirming the Bible over and over and over again. So uh, we can stand on the word of God and uh, we do not need to deny the complete trustworthiness of, of scripture, even when it is making claims with regard to history. I'm sure you've been confused when you've read, read the first and second chronicles, for instance. And if you've ever thought, well, where are these kings? Some of them are in the north and some of them are in the south. And when you look at their dates, they don't match up. And you think, well, I wasn't taught the history of the kings and queens of England like that. You know, well, you know one, one year ended and the, next, and the same year the next, whoever it was, the king or the queen came. And of course, the dates do not tie up in, in First and Second Chronicles. They're all over the show. And why is that? Well, when you know a little bit of history, you know that there were vice regencies and they overlapped. And sometimes the king who came to the throne was too young, okay? And so he, he had a regent who, re who reigned in his stead until he was of age to reign on his own. And, and, and that, uh, when you know that and you work out the regencies and the overlap, it makes sense. But when you just look at them themselves and you write down a piece of paper by the side of your Bible, these dates, you say, they just don't add up. They don't follow consecutively at all. But they do when you go further into history and you give account of the regencies that there were. Now, if we do not accept inerrancy, then we are forced to two conclusions. Either that scripture is not all from God or that God is not always dependable. Okay? If we do not accept inerrancy, we have to say scripture is not all from God, or God is not always dependable. And we know that those two statements are, are, are not right at all. Um, I've given you a quote there from Packer, and that's a great quote. One cannot doubt the Bible without far-reaching loss, both of fullness of truth and of fullness of life. I like those two phrases that he brings together there. Fullness of truth and fullness of life. If therefore we have at heart spiritual renewal for society, for churches and for our own lives, we shall make much of the entire trustworthiness, that is the inerrancy of Holy Scripture as the inspired and liberating word of God. So we have an unerring book, a divine book, an utterly reliable book in front of us here. And then I think I'll just move on. Do not miss the staggering claim of 2 Peter 1.19. Okay? Now, some scholars think that verse 19 should be translated, and we have something more sure. Now, when the ESV came out, that's the English Standard Version, which is quite a literal translation of the text. The NIV, 
would not read as literally as the ESV reads. Now, the ESV, in its first edition, had it translated, and we have something more sure. It changed that translation in the second edition. But if we went for the translation, and we have something more sure, in that case, Peter could be saying that the prophetic word of Scripture on the written word, was a surer testimony than his eyewitness account of the transfiguration, which is mentioned in verses 17 and 18. And then he would be saying, if you don't trust my eyes, if you think I didn't see what I've actually seen and written to you about, then trust the prophetic word, the written word of the text. That we have something more we are even more sure of the written word than we are of my personal eyewitness testimony to the transfiguration of Christ. So whatever the best translation is, Peter's view of scripture remains exactly the same. So, a last question. Do you talk about scripture the way the apostles talk about scripture? You can think sometimes too highly of your own interpretations of Scripture, but you cannot think too highly of Scripture's interpretation of itself. You got it? You and I can think too highly about our own interpretation and what we think it's saying, but we cannot think too highly of Scripture's interpretation of itself. And you can use the word of God to come to wrong conclusions. But you cannot find any wrong conclusions in the word of God. And in this book, and you know I'm not denying hearing the voice of God today, but I do want to stir you up <laughs> by, remember, by reminding you that you can listen to the voice of God every day here and get excited about that. And this book only records what he said. You know, you haven't got to read it with a discernment and say, is this true or is this not true? Is, is verse 8 true, but verse 9 isn't true? Every word of it is true. So immerse yourself in the word of God, and you will not find a more completely reliable book that you can build your life and your faith upon than this book here. So read it, and reread it, <laughs> and reread it again and ask the Spirit of God to give you fresh revelation and understanding. And you know, you've heard me say before, you know, if you want to know the Holy Spirit better, you want to know the Holy Spirit better? You really want to know the Holy Spirit better? What was the greatest thing the Holy Spirit did? All scriptures given by inspiration of God. Men wrote as they were carried along by the Spirit of God. You will know the Spirit better, the better you know what the Spirit wrote and what the Spirit regards as his greatest action and work, the Word of God. Okay? Great. Oh, any questions? David. Yeah. Uh, with various translations of the Bible, they're not all the same. Yes, there are that. differences, and some of those differences can be quite profound. How do you cope with that? How do you deal with, with the Different, differences? It, yes, yes. Um, th 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 there are basically two, two different types of translations. There are word-for-word -word translations. Now, when you read a word-for-word -word translation, that's quite a literal translation than the ESV. And the NIV is towards the literal word-for-word -word translation. Um, the sense of the passage, the readability of the passage, is sacrificed a little for 
at the exact or a more exact translation. Then you get the thought for thought translation at this end at the scale, where the translator or the paraphraser has decided he's read the original documents and he's thought, now what is this saying? I'll put that in my own English. And all translations you can plot are on that sort of graph. Word for word here, thought for thought here, and there's somewhere along there. The New Living Translation is about in the middle. And that is a good translation for that reason. Uh, you know, Eugene Peterson, the message, whoa, that's right down here, thought for thought. Isn't it? Isn't, isn't it? You, 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 you can sense that. The, the new RSV is more up here towards the, the um, literal word for word translation. I would say if you can afford it, you need two translations of the Bible. If you can afford a minimum uh, of two. One is a literal word for word translation. That's when you're doing serious study of the Word of God and you use your thought for thought translation when you just want to page read. You know, read this page, this next page, and you just want to read it like you would read a storybook. So you do need two. You, you can't use your thought for thought for serious study of the Word of God. You need your literal word for word translation to get, to get at that. Okay? But if you say, I just want to read, I don't want to read five chapters today, you know? Or I want to read the book of Hebrews today. You know, read it in the thought for thought. But if you want to study it, then you need to go into your, your word for word. Now, most translators um, would say that although there is a difference, the differences in no way alter any major Christian belief. You know, um, you, you know, a, a lot of debate over Isaiah, we're coming up to Christmas again, whether the word should, in the Hebrew should be translated young woman or a virgin will conceive. Now, the Hebrew word can mean young woman. So some translators has, have used the word young woman there. And the ultra-conservatives then jump up and say, oh no, you're, you're undermining the belief in the, vir in the virgin conception of Jesus there. It should be virgin. But maybe the translators were not wanting to undermine the historicity of the virgin conception of Jesus. They were simply saying, I recognize now, as far as we can understand what the historical meaning of this verb was, it was a young woman. Now, of course, that's not such a bad thing, because a young woman in that culture was basically going to be a virgin. She wouldn't have had sexual relationships. Completely different sexual climate than we live in today. So to use the phrase young woman is not to deny her virginity at all. So that, 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 sort, of, that, that sort of way um, around it. I, I think the bigger question, and I'm wrestling whether even in the last talk I might look at this, it's where Christians um, interpret the Bible differently. That's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the meaty one. That's the, that's the difficult one. Why, why do evangelical Christians, you know, interpret the same verse in a different way? Um, but I don't know, I, I would need, I've never spoken on that before, but it's something down through the years, as I look back on, I thought, it needs a study, but <laughs> I've got to I give myself time to do that. But, you know, that's, that's important. Okay, any, any other? Okay. Uh, you spoke about, you used the word concursive operation, which was a new word for me, concursive. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we recognize it in different writers of different books in the Bible have, have different styles. You can, you can almost hear their personality and character coming out. How is there, is there such a thing as hmm, the human imperfection coming through? For example, are there, there are, are there some books that are better than others? And how does that relate to the infallible word of God, that some were better communicators at certain things than others. Yeah, I think I, 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 I let me, can I just come at, at, at it a, a different way? Um, 
When you read the Greek of the New Testament, and I'm better on the Greek than I am on the Hebrew, so I talk to you about the Greek in the, in the New Testament, it, you, you see a difference there. When you read Luke's Gospel and the Acts of the Apostles, this is great scholarly, cl more classical Greek. Okay? When you read John's Gospel, you think, wow, this is very limited Greek. Limited in its vocabulary, in the type of words it uses. Very simple. Um, John's Gospel, when you start to learn Greek and you're learning it from the New Testament itself, you always learn it from John's Gospel because it is the simplest Gospel of them all to, uh, uh, to, to read in the original languages. Okay? When you go to 1 John, and I would accept John's uh, authorship of 1 John, I, I, whether John was having a bad day or whatever it was, there are lots of mistakes in the Greek there. You know, maybe he's getting a bit old when he wrote 1 John, you know, and that was written towards the end of the first century. So, you know, and, and then it, I could even talk to you about the Greek of the book of Revelation as well. So it, it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, so, so there, there are those, but the, you see, those differences are all in the manuscripts. When we say inspiration and inerrancy, we're saying that about the original documents. Now, of course, we don't have any original documents. Now, I've had to weed a lot out here because I didn't want to bamboozle you. But it's a very interesting study on the transmission of the text because I believe the Spirit not only inspired the writers, but the Spirit also supervised the transmission of the text down through the centuries so that what we have here, we can fully trust. There is no verse in this book that is going to lead me astray, either in practice or belief. So th there are those, and, and I take it that the belief in inspiration and inerrancy means that um, if, in fact, on the original document a mistake was made, then that, I don't believe that, that could have happened under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. It obviously happened in the copying of the manuscripts because we, you know, when you look at these copies of the manuscripts we have, you know, the monk has scribbled a note either in the margin or he's blotted something out because he's put the wrong word in there, you know. So, you know, so we know that they, you know, you know, that the monks made mistakes. We know they did. And, and you imagine, you know, um, I gave you that, you know, not everything in our Bibles is inspired by God, which is a bit of a... Uh, um, a provocative title, if you can see. But if I ever get round to talking to you about what I mean by that, is that obviously the chapter divisions are not inspired by God. The verse divisions were not inspired by God. The original text of Scripture was written in capitals with no full stops, no commas, and no gaps between the words. So I've given you a sentence there just for you to try and read it. So you can imagine what the, the job the translators had, trying to decipher a text like that. And, and normally it was in, in, in two columns, some later uh, uh, manuscripts, you know, coming up to the 10th century and such like, were then in three columns, but basically they were in two columns. And oh, when I typed that lot out, I didn't get it all accurately out either side. But they would have had, they would have broken off the word, not on the syllable, but just on the letter, you know, so that it fitted exactly boo, between two lines going across like that. Do, 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 do. And, and when you get home, get that out and, uh, and, and try and see whether you can read it. Well, I know what it said. So reading a biblical writing, and then you can try and make out of it. But do, does that answer? Yeah, yeah, it answers uh, a poorly worded question. Can I ask a second question? Yeah, of then? course. Um, the so different over the centuries translators have got better would that be the right word in in, in they've, they've had access to more sources and presumably their mastery of the ancient languages has improved with more scholarship so yes why why do you think god has allowed that that there there are things there are 
errors in, in translation in, say, the King James Bible 500 years ago, but he allowed 500 years of some misunderstandings in the church. To, yeah, are you thinking of anything in particular? Uh, actually, yes, although I'm not sure it's necessary. In fact, it's not in, in any... Tra I'm thinking of some passages in Paul's letters where some say he would... Controversial passages he is quoting back at his uh, readers, their original uh, letter to him, for example, and people have right. taken that as what Paul was saying when in actual fact it was the point he was arguing against. I'm, I'm thinking of things like that, which actually mm -hmm. is not the same as, as my question because that's not in yes, King James, like, it's not even in, in yes. our current translations. Mm. But I'm wondering whether in 500 years' time people will look back and see our translations as mm. with, I, with I their think inadequacies. That, it, it, translation work is always an ongoing thing, isn't it? Because language, it, it changes. Now, remember that the, both the uh, Old Testament Hebrew and the New Testament Greek are, are, are dead languages. What is spoken in, in Israel today and what is spoken in Greece today is a modern version of it. And, and this is why, you know, I said to the, I gave the, the girl down in the Nigerian church in London at the weekend um, a, a real awful passage to read with, with names from the Old Testament, you know, from, from kings there. And I said, I had to say afterwards, you know, and she made a really good go of it, actually. And I said afterwards, you know, we don't know how to pronounce these words because nobody is speaking this language today and nobody has spoken it for years. And then I remember the first time I went to Greece um, and to the Greek islands, I thought I'm going to at last be able to read the, all the signs and everything else. But then one Greek script is so different, you know. So, so, so there we are. So, so you, so there's a, they're dead languages, and we don't know the exact pronunciation of them, uh, as far as that goes. But as you were saying, David, uh, archaeological discoveries deepen our understanding of certain words. But again, the overriding controlling factor is that no major doctrine is changed by that. I read a scholarly article this this week. On, and, uh, on, on this uh, American theologian speaking about, you know, Paul's uh, encouragement to women to wear hats. And she was tying it in with that obscure verse in Leviticus and, and, and Deuteronomy about men with beards and, and, and cutting beards, shaving beards and everything else. I thought, dear me, this is really getting, t getting technical. Now, uh, it, 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 I mean, I just laughed at it. I just laughed at it because um, when I was a student in theology, I was in Northern Ireland m amongst Baptist churches there where the women had to wear hats in a lot of churches. And in some of the churches I preached, and when you came in, there were um, caps and things, even for the ladies to wear, hanging up in the church. And a deacon was there on the door. And if your head was uncovered as a woman, then you would have been asked, kind of, we, the women's hat, you know, we, uh, you know are, are to be covered. That, that's a submission to the angels and submission to the men. Now, we know from a lot of further uh, investigation that, you know, what that word actually means now, and it doesn't mean that, you know, that you have to cover your head, that your hair is given to you as your covering. It was the cult prostitutes who shave their heads as part of uh, uh, evidence of what they were. And so Paul says, your hair is your glory. Women, let your hair grow so nobody will ever think of you as being a loose, moral woman, but will recognize you as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. And, and you, and, and then, I mean, we had endless discussions about this in Ireland. And, and you, you know, you, oh, you ha that shows that you're married if you, wear, if you cover your head. You know, and I said, no, no, no you know, th th these are cultural symbols. And what's the cultural symbol that we, ha we have, that you have that you're married at this moment? You have a ring on your finger. So, so it, it, what's the cultural equivalent of, of, of that? So, so we can be over-literal as far as far that goes. But no major doctrine has been altered or changed through a mistranslation. 
you know, I, I mean, somebody one, once came up to me and said, and I, I, hadn't, I hadn't spotted this one, I've got a number of them in the back of my mind there, and said, oh, the Bible's not, uh, um, not true historically, so, and, or, or, uh, and knew that I was interested in ornithology, in the study of birds. And, oh, it speaks about bats and birds together. So I said, well, you know, the Bible does speak about it. It does. So I said, I said, I have never noticed that in the Bible. I don't know the answer to that. But I'll go and read about bats and birds. Well, of course, when you think, when I read the thing, you know, and, 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 and ornithologically, uh, you know, bats and birds are not in the same group. But you could see somebody writing the Bible putting bats and other birds together because bats fly. You know, they didn't have the scientific knowledge that we have that puts them as different species, bats and birds. But you can imagine somebody writing, you know, all those thousands of years ago, hey, bats fly, they're a bird. <laughs> you know? So you, you could, you could, you could, so you're going to find, try and find out where bats and birds are in the Bible. I can assure you they're there. They're, they're, they're there. Okay? Thank you. All right, let's just pray then. Father, thank you for your word. What a treasure. What a treasure we have in it. Father, may we regard it as precious. May we read it as much as we can. May we sow your word in our hearts. And may the living word Christ dwell in us richly, we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen.